the boxing show that's knocking out the competition. The kick ass podcast that make you want to listen. The place where boxing fans and fighters rejoice. Thumbs up for Richie, you're listening to the fighter's voice. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Richard Ortiz of The Fighter's Voice, the only voice that matters. And I'm like our guest, Otis Griffin. We're simply knocking out the competition. We got a great show for you tonight. Tonight, we're going to discuss this weekend's fight. Josh Taylor, the undefeated, undisputed, super lightweight champion of the world, taking on the Efimo Lopez. The takeover is back, and we shall see. It's taking place in New York City by way of top-ranked boxing ESPN. And we're also going to break down the 140-pound division. Who's next in line? Who's the next great champion, so to speak? And who's going to win? What's our take on Bud Crawford, Errol Spence? As for me, my answer changes every single day. But before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor right here. Power Aid. Hey, whenever you're thirsty, whenever you need to get through the day, and whenever you need a pickup, it's simply knocking out the competition. Remember, the Fighter's Voice, proud sponsor of Power Aid. I'm going to get a drink right now and let everybody know I'm not just holding it up. With some ice in it, man, ice is nice. And I want to thank our other sponsor right here. You see how there's nothing on it? Sponsored by Richard Ortiz of The Fighter's Voice. Because if you're interested in joining the Fighter's Voice team, please subscribe to our channel, www.youtube.com slash The Fighter's Voice. Remember, every fighter has a voice, and so do you. Enough said. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce our guest today, the former WBO and also NABO light heavyweight champion of the world and the winner of the next great champion. It was on Fox TV. By way of Oscar De La Hoya, Bernard Hopkins uh, got great advice from all the um, athletes and all the warriors and Hall of Famers, Roy Jones included. Ladies and gentlemen, Otis Triple OG Griffin. Welcome to the Fighter's Voice, my man. Hey, Richard. Thank you for having me. Hey, man. Hey, what was your day like today, man? I mean, you know, waking up and 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 going through the process of your day, because I know you're a busy man. I can read your resume, but it's better if it comes out of your mouth uh, by you, the champ. Well, this year has been great to me. I, obviously, um, I um, am a brand new grandparent. Uh, my, Congratulations. My, uh, my baby girl, uh, my, my granddaughter, uh, uh, Avia, uh, was, was born uh, May 20th. And um, it's just been an outstanding year. I've had uh, uh, kids that have graduated from college. I've had, uh, you know, kids that became state workers. Uh, and um, I have a daughter that's uh, also graduating top honors uh, uh, at her University of St. Louis, uh, Amani, uh, in, here in December. So, um, and then just last night, we had uh, my, my other daughter, uh, Dakota, uh, graduate high school. So we got one more left, and that is uh, uh, Grace. And uh, and then we'll be, uh, you know, uh, empty nesters. So uh, besides that, uh, my day uh, usually starts off uh, with, with me uh, working with uh, with uh, one of my fighters or, or whatever. I uh, also manage uh, fighters. So if I'm not flying around uh, the world, uh, I, I'm usually uh, working with one or two fighters. Uh, today I was working with uh, Nafis uh, Anos, who is uh, the uh, Middle Eastern Egyptian uh, light heavyweight champion. And wait until you guys see this guy, 6'4" lean twisted still and um now we're just putting a lot of science into him that he's never had from being over in the middle east he's just really been you guys take a look at him on a on, on video he's on he's been beating people really with just natural physical strength you know um he's uh only had uh four fights he's four and oh two of those fights are 10 rounders oh wow already yeah so you say you manage, talk to us, you manage, you manage fighters, because uh, I know, you know, former uh, uh, professional football player, or do you, do you manage athletes in general? And where's your passion at? Uh, we manage athletes in, in general. I, I work uh, with a, a company by the name of MG Ring. So I was talking about uh, MG Ring. So uh, MG Ring, okay, uh, yeah. as I was saying, is a is a company that uh, that deals in, um, is, is, is really a, a, a talent agent, as you would say. Uh, it, it deals okay. in all sports, uh, in entertainment as well as uh, uh, print modeling and, uh, and, and movies. They make movies. So uh, what I did was I fostered in a, um, a concept which uh, brings uh, uh, athletics as a vehicle 
to uh, life after athletics. So with the, a lot of the fighters, uh, a lot of people don't understand that um, in other sports, you're not able to see or, or know uh, a fighter or even recognize his face. When I was in the NFL, uh, club announcers would all the time say, oh, hey, we got Otis Griffin in the house. People standing right next to me and everything. They don't know who I am because I wear a helmet. <laughs> and I'm not a first-round draft pick. So um, uh, now uh, I've, I've uh, fostered an ideal that, hey, boxers are seen all the time. You know, like for, for 12 rounds or however many rounds on a, on a major show, you're seen. Your face is recognized, even if somebody doesn't recognize your name. So the more we increase that, now we can uh, segue that into life after boxing with, with commercials, movies, and so on. That's wonderful. I mean, everybody has a visions of wanting to do something, especially um, uh, fighters. You know, they'll do anything to make an income and be successful without always having to get punched in the face. Uh, you know, that's a tough living, and it's a small window, the sport of boxing. Uh, and you just said it best. I mean, they get to see your face for 12 rounds of the promotion. And, you know, the fighters, you know, unless you're a Heisman Trophy winner, top pick, I mean, you're not going to get those endorsements. Mm -hmm. So I like what you're doing. So what do you, what advice do you offer the athlete today that just wants to um, promote him or herself um, by, by just people knowing who they are? Uh, there's a lot of avenues. We live in the information era. Uh, I would say, uh, of course, build your, uh, your, your, yourself up on, uh, on social media. But uh, even before doing that, a lot of people don't lay the groundwork at home, you know, like in your, your own city. The best thing you can do is become famous in your own city before branching off because your, your foundation will be so strong that p other people will pour into it from all around the world or around your country. Hey, that's, that's the groundwork right there and that, that's the root. Now, l let me say this. When you were playing football, were you recognized as a football player or was it until you became a fighter and also had that uh, TV reality show? How much did that uh, play a part in your professionalism? I was always recognized as a football player. Um, I come from a football family that had myself and uh, about nine other uh, people in my family and my, uh, my cousins and everything, you know, be it from, you know, uh, second, third or whatever cousins have uh, have uh, played in the NFL or had a cup of coffee in the NFL. So I'm from Alabama. Uh, we breed football players, you know. So I always grew up, you know, I, I started playing football at six years old and didn't stop until I was like 23, you know, uh, and started boxing when I was 24. So how did you make that transition? And, and why did you make that transition if, if you had a, a promising football career? Uh, it's um, uh, actually a story that's uh, around in a ring magazine. Um, I was uh, with uh, in, uh, in, um, in camp in the arena football league, actually, at the time. And I got in a fight with one of my teammates. And uh, he was a martial artist. He knew uh, Caballera, uh, the uh, Pacific uh, martial arts that, uh, that you see uh, on the video games with Eddie Gordo and Tekken, with it involves dancing. And, and as long as it was a street fight, you know, I was coming from the shoulders and everything, getting with him. And then um, once he got mad and, and bring that into the game, I was just like, whoa, and he beat me down. So after we both got kicked off the team, <laughs> I um, uh, came back uh, home and I was going to uh, begin working for the Department of Corrections at, uh, uh, with the state of California. And um, and I was like, oh, man, you know, uh, I got to, you know, learn how to defend myself more than just, you know, regular street fighting uh, because – who knows one of these inmates or somebody might, might, might know a former martial arts. So I started, I took like five different martial arts and um, it just so happened the gym that I was at uh, kickboxing incorporated was owned by Nasser Navarone, who was now a promoter. But at the time he had uh, myself, Eric Regan, uh, Michael Sims, who was a gold medalist uh, in the USA Olympic team, probably one of the best uh, USA fighters uh, ever uh, to come out of that amateur program. Uh, you know, other pros like Chris Cruz, Gilbert Zaragoza, and uh, and, and also uh, uh, Big Gil uh, Martinez, uh, who was a, a heavyweight that fought Tony Tubbs and all those guys. So yeah. once he saw my athletic ability, he actually saw it before I, before I did. Uh, I was coming every day for like six months and uh, just trying to, you know, get a good workout in. And uh, once he saw it, he, he, he plugged me in. And looking back, it made sense. You know, if, you, if you're paid to run backwards, for a living and move laterally. Now, if you add punches to that, what do you got? Exactly. Exactly. I was about to ask you, how did that transition from football 
uh, to, to boxing, and there it is there. And also just the, uh, you said show up for six months, and I bet you were just letting it all hang out for six months because training camp prepped you for hitting the bag and, and uh, ring generalship and lateral movement and uh, ability to move in and out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I think the, the main thing that he, uh, he uh, appreciated was that I came every day. A lot of people say that they want to be a part of something, and then, you know, like two weeks later, like, oh, hey, man, this came up, da, da, da. Like, I, like he didn't even talk to me for, for six months. Like, I come every day. I, I joke around with the guys like, oh, man, you guys lucky he don't let me in there with you. I'd tear you all up. You know, then I take the class, you know, take about five different martial arts classes and leave or whatever. Then finally, they were running out of sparring partners. And they were, he was like, hey, you're always talking. Get in there. And then uh, I got in there. I couldn't hit him, but they couldn't hit me because, like, one punch, like a guy throws a jab. And I jump all the way across the room off of one leg, you know. <laughs> so, I'm, 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 I was going to ask you about your your nickname. Was that something established inside the boxing ring, or did that carry over from the football field? It's a little of both. A lot of people always assume that um, I came from a gang related background or whatever, but uh, you know, I don't have any horror stories. My 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 mother was a. Uh, uh, a uh, evangelist, uh, uh, a, a, a minister, as well as my my stepfather, and then um, so I've always been raised in a in a, in a Christian environment, and then um, uh, I'm a third generation uh, Otis Griffin, so that's where Triple OG okay. comes in, and then with myself being a Christian, the Trinity of God. So Triple OG are the letters T O G, the Trinity of God. You know. Okay, there you go. There you go. I, I like that. I like that. Actually, you brought it up, so you opened up a window. Um, Showtime um, aired um, Andre Ward. Uh, it was uh, uh, it was uh, Son of God, the Book of Ward, mm -hmm. right, on Showtime. And I'm watching this thing. And before it even came out, uh, he released, you know, some um, posters that, hey, it's going to be coming on. So, like, for three weeks, I said, this is a must-see. I tagged him. I tagged uh, Diaz. I tagged all his uh, sparring partners, uh, Kilo the Kid Madera, who's one of his sparring partners. Little did I know. Check this out, man. I'm watching it. I'm just relaxing because, you know, Andre Ward is class act. All of a sudden, I hear an interview. It's by Kovalov. And he says something to the effect is um, this reporter asked him a question. And the answer he gave is, I'm going to bring all my arsenal inside of the ring to defeat Andre Ward. And when he said that, I sat up on my bed, almost spilled my drink and said, what the? I guess, is there any way possible you could rewind that? So they rewinded that interview. And lo and behold, you can barely see my nose in my chin. What they did is they cropped me out. They didn't use my voice to ask the question. But it was over eight seconds of, of Kovalov answering a question that I asked and Showtime aired it. So, hmm. you know, I felt kind of like, OK, that's be cool. <laughs> you know, I got to see, I got to see that take place. But I was kind of I watched the very end. You know, I was like, OK, you know, you know, question by the fighter's voice. But I guess that's a start where, hey, I must be doing something positive because if they use they could have used anybody in this whole universe. Oh, yeah. And they yeah. use the fighter's voice uh, segment, the question that I asked. So I, I say that because it kind of goes in when you son of God, the initials in the initials that you had and what they stand for. So, yeah. And I don't know if you were aware, but uh, when I was, when I was coming up, uh, uh, me and Andre Ward sparred thousands of rounds. I'm in Sacramento, California. He's in Oakland, California. We drove back and forth. Uh, our two coaches, Nasser and uh, Virgil, they, they know each other very well. All of my trainers, tra trainers in the, in the past have known Virgil very well. So it always continued but between Ray Woods or Saifedema team. You know, uh, they've all they've all uh, been in the same uh, boxing LBC as amateurs, and then and then grown together. So I've been knowing. I, I I just told him the other day when they showed a clip from uh, when he was talking about uh, his hiatus from boxing when he was younger. Uh, I had yeah. text uh, uh, Dre and, and was like, "Hey, I knew Dre with the braids." <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. He's, he's used, to be, he used to be a, a more sleep slider guy, you know, with, with the with the cornrows and everything. But uh always a boxing dictionary, man. That dude that dude knows boxing like, you know, like a like a like a like a book, you know, like a book of boxing, the information in his head. I remember the most amazing thing he ever did when we were sparring was um I finally I think we had maybe this is you know, we had sparred a handful of times or more. And uh and and you you know me, 
I'm I'm a nobody at the time, so I'm just like, man, you know, even and I'm not even a pro, and I'm like, man, you know what? Um, I just got to figure out a way to get the best of this dude because you know he's the one with the name and and, and everybody knows who he is. I just got to get better by by you know uh, uh, you know getting better against Andre. So I finally got it. Lying. You know, I was like, okay, when he when he comes out and he does this, this is my answer because I used to watch tons of video. One thing that that sped up my growth as a, as a fighter because I started so late was I would watch video over and over and over and I would mimic guys. guys. That's one thing I brought over from football because you know, the drills, like you mimic people. So, so I would mimic Ali. I would mimic, uh, 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 Holyfield. I would mimic, uh, uh, Roberto Duran, you know? So, uh, I would take every fighter's best attributes and mimic them. Anyway, going back to Dre. So I get in there and I stopped one of his styles i'm like yeah i got him man you know he he he's gonna attack me and i'm gonna you know uh use this mongoose style and i'm gonna and i'm gonna get him mm -hmm. boom so he comes back the next round he has a whole nother style then he comes back at the end of that round and he has another style so he went from from counter punching to floating to uh, uh, uh taking the center of the ring and attacking me and then finally two rounds later he turned southpaw and he was killing me southpaw. And I, and, and then I'm like, yo, like, how's he able to fight that good southpaw? So <laughs> after it was over, you know, we all uh, would talk like uh, Virgil's a very uh, uh, intelligent guy. And he, and he loves like, you know, spreading bo boxing knowledge. And he was like, well, a lot of people don't know, but Andre is actually left-handed. I made, I make him fight conventional. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, my, Michael Moore yeah. and also uh, Oscar De La Hoya. He's actually yeah. left-handed, right-handed. Yeah. Wow. Wow. No wonder he's just, yeah, okay. I can see that now. I can see that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, long story short, I mean, with him and Kovalev, uh, the first one was close, but the second one, there was no there was no doubt in, in, in his uh, mind who was the winner after that. Yeah. You know, I want to jump a, a few steps here. And I, I talked to you outside of this uh, interview and just your knowledge, because I – You'd be surprised a lot of fighters, they're really actually not uh, students of the game mm -hmm. or they only concentrate on, on their own careers. Mm -hmm. But we were having a conversation. I said, man, I, I got to get you on the show and, and we got to just break this down. Your, your knowledge and just the respect. I mean, everything that word that comes out of your mouth, man. Now, in the other equation, we have uh, who will be moving up. I mean, there's no need for him to run. I don't think, you know, there's no need for him to run it back with with um, uh, Lomachenko. Um, I'm thinking Devin Haney and they haven't matched him up, but I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think like a manager. I'm trying to think like a, a, a matchmaker for Devin Haney to come up. Uh, the perfect opposition for him to be is Jose Ramirez. You're taking on a former unified champion that doesn't move around too much, a very pressure, uh, a pressure fighter. And Devin Haney would want to give him angles. I'm thinking his first, a uh, fight at 140, maybe someone to the likes of Jose Ramirez. If in fact that matchup does take place, how do you see that panning out? Uh, I think it'd be a paint job by Devin Haney. But one thing that he does very well is he's a he's a good floater and a, a good ridden, rheumatic uh, fighter uh, off the uh, off the counter and everything off the back foot. Um, and and he's very strong. He's uh, uh I think at 140 he's going to be even stronger. Uh, it's uh, so. you know he's at that uh, that that age where uh you, you you're just starting to uh, uh get your your gorf and your 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 your, your uh, man strength so uh um i think it's the perfect time for him to move to 140 i think he's he would it would actually not be if 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 i was managing him it would not be smart for him to run it back with lamachenko with with a guy like lamachenko's boxing iq he's going to put different wrinkles into the fight and then also um it's not smart for him to fight Shakur Stevens because Shakur Stevens, believe it or not, is the dark horse in, in this whole thing. Shakur Stevenson is, uh, I have him circled on my list. Uh, the dark horse I would actually say would be Arnold Barboza, who just can't get a break. The man's undefeated. He's on his last, uh, off his contract, I believe, in August. Hasn't got the big fights. Hasn't got the 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 just do or the opportunity. Well, let me take that back. I can't say the opportunity. Even though Regis did offer him a fight with three weeks notice, um, you, you got to stay that gym right inside the gym. I believe he was in shape and ready to go. I just think, it, in fact, it has something to do with numbers. 
Do you see that as a possible uh, matchup? And how do you see that fight panning out? Arnold Barboza taking on the Rougarou, Regis Pro Gray. Well, I, 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 one thing I love about Regis, you know, him, he's from the boot, you know, uh, uh, down in uh, uh, Louisiana. And um, down there, they don't turn down fights, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? in the street or whatever. And I've always loved that about him. He'll fight anybody, anywhere. I commended him for going and fighting uh, Josh Taylor even overseas because people don't understand there's only been maybe 10 fighters in, in the history of boxing from America that have ever won a, a title abroad, you know. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, you gotta, you gotta commend anybody that can, that can do that. You know, like, like Earl Spence or Polly Malianji, uh, you know, who's a uh, Tim Bradley, uh, you know, guys like that, that can even do that because that's like something that, that is unheard of. And usually Americans want guys to come over here. But, um, I think that, um, it's a, it's a, it's a serious matchup, but I see, uh, uh, Regis, he just has, um, the ability to adapt, which is what all the great ones have, you know. So I think that that he may he he edges that in 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 a in a majority decision type uh, situation. And I will say this: Regis is a student of the game. He he's a throwback, and uh, you know, Mike he, Mike Tyson is one of his favorite fighters. And and some of the things that he picked up from Mike Tyson is he reads literature. He continues to feed his mind, his body, and his soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, the last time I spoke to Regis. He said he would never go back and, and fight Josh Taylor in his backyard. He said, that's not happening. He said, we're fighting in the States, but he does want to run it back. And that's one um, person that's on his radar. Uh, another is they've been going back and forth, but they just can't come to an agreement is uh, Jose Ramirez. And uh, I believe um, that one had something to do with the percentage, the numbers in the network. Uh, yeah. He just was with another promotion company before he went with a uh, matchroom. Yeah, well, Matchroom should should be able to get the numbers uh, for him definitely because they they, they do that. But in, in uh you know, and any anybody can tell you that a lot of people don't really understand the split between a champion and a and a, a contender or even a, a even a number one contender. You, you you're probably not going to get more than uh than thirty five percent of the, of the lion's share of of the purse. Everything else is going to go to the champion, and 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 as a champion, you're going to stand on that. Unless you guys are doing blockbuster numbers like Hagler Hearns or something like that, where you like, yeah. or, or when uh, Roy Jones and uh, in, in, in Hopkins had the famous argument, you know, 60 40, I whipped your ass, you know, uh, that's that's the kind of things that, that, that happens. Because really, in, in honesty, Roy was saying, hey, I'm supposed to get 75 and you're supposed to get 25, but we are such big names and, and this is going to make such so much money. Agree to 60-40 and I'm going to whip you. It's not going to be 50-50 because I'm the champion. But, hey, you, I'll, I'll meet you at 60-40 just to get this blockbuster fight on. And I think that that could happen with Regis and, 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 and Rivera. You know what? That would be a good matchup. You know, um, I, I spoke to Jose, and I, I speak to Jose uh, frequently. He's actually a personal friend of mine. But when I call the boxing, when I call the 140-pound division, I don't let my personal uh, feelings get in the way of my professionalism and what I know. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, because, in fact, I did put Josh Taylor as the kingpin of the 140-pound division and also Regis Pro Gray as the face of the 140-pound division. Brother, I got blocked. I got whatever. <laughs> it, 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 it's just you, you name it. People don't talk to me anymore. Or it just it is what it is, man. But you got to remember, if you're a fan, then you stick with with your who you grew up with. Mm -hmm. But if you're a professional, you got to call it like you see it. Because mm -hmm. in boxing, I'm never going to bet the mortgage on even the fighter that that's favored. Um, you know, even Mike Tyson had his day with Buster. Uh, boxing, oh, yeah. it is what it is, and we saw yeah. evidence of that. I would say three weeks ago, a lot of people still going back and forth. I personally had it 75 for uh, 75 Loma, but hey, I'm sitting here watching it. I'm not there. Uh, to see it up there live and to see every angle that was uh, taking place. Before I go any further, where does Ryan Garcia fit in this equation uh, in the 140 pound division? Uh, my, my, you know, I, I came up as a Golden Boy fighter, of course. Knowing how they work over there, they're they're a highly intelligent company with with a lot of Hall of Famers that have influence and in, in, uh, a lot of matchmakers and in, 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 in everything. There's always an angle, right? So, with that being said. Uh, there's been mention of Ryan fighting Adrian Broner, which isn't a bad idea that. because now you got a guy that is a, a, a three or four time uh, a world champion 
that is on his way out and his his life outside of boxing you know the reason they make fights like that is because people don't understand like how many spies people these guys put in gyms and stuff man they know hey hey this guy is you know he's talking a good talk but he's not really doing what he's supposed to do in the gym we all know that that ab is an outstanding talent in boxing but sometimes it just doesn't come together and 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 i say that because look look how much he accomplished with not even getting his full uh uh um how would you say his full uh uh projection of what he yeah. was going to do. You know what I'm saying? Like that. So Matt, if, so if he would have actually put the blinders on, he would, we've been talking about him being one of the greatest ever, but Absolutely. with that being said, now you attach that name to your young fighter, Ryan, that is hungry. And you know that, that uh, there's a chance that, that Adrian's going to party too much or whatever. He wins a, 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 a title against uh, Adrian or, 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 or even a vacant title or, or let's say that they just do a, um, a eliminator, right? So that's going to give Ryan more prestige. Then Ryan goes on and beats a, a fighter that has a belt that that um, that is has less pedigree, like Roly, and you just created a monster. <laughs> so that's, that's what I think that they're, they're going to do. That's the perfect word because uh, uh, Roly was in my head, and uh, you're very you're being very nice when you said less pedigree. In, in Roly, <laughs> um, you know what came to my mind when you were uh, you, you went on about Adrian Broner? I would I would let him in. He'd be the last man I'd let in. In his first matchup, I'd I'd I'd, I'd give him a title shot. I think him and Roly would be a great fight. You know why? Because somebody has to win. Yeah, he Broner's I mean, never out of a matchup. fight. Think about that matchup. Yeah, it'd be exciting. It'd be exciting, but I but I think Broner would pick him apart, of course, out of experience and, and just pure natural talent. People don't really uh, understand how big Adrian Broner is for those weight classes, you know. Uh, uh, he has a huge back, his yeah. back, his shoulders. I yeah. mean, he's and he's he's strong, very yeah. strong. His yeah. neck, I mean, he's strong. Really, the only reason that he lost the fights that he did is because he went above one forty. If he's at one forty. Uh, uh, to 135. If he, even if he would have yeah. stayed at uh, 135 longer, he may have never, uh, never lost. See, everybody wants to be uh, like Floyd Mayweather and everything, but they don't really understand that he he started at 130. He stayed at 135 until all those guys cleared out, like like Shane Mosley and all those guys. So he's yeah. uh, he's a thinker and he's actually um, a very smart guy because all his father and his uncle had been around the game. A long time way before him so he waited for those divisions to clear out and then he was the only name in those divisions and he and he was building his his uh his uh talent uh at the time you understand what i'm saying like taking fights yeah. fighting frequently making his money building his name and uh, enhancing his uh his sharpening his skills let's say and 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 finally you know it all culminated into him being one of the best of all time quick question yes or no does Tank Davis move up to the 140 pound division to go after those big fights to put his name in ink as one of the greats? I think that the Tank uh, is is going to. People don't really understand how small Tank is. He's a he's yeah. a little big man. Like he kind of reminds me of of Henry Armstrong. Even you know what I'm saying like like a, a guy that's small but could really give a, a, a middle way to run if he, <laughs> if he wanted to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, um, but uh, uh, that's why they have weight classes. You know, you don't want to get too in, uh, intoxicated with, with, well with your power or, or saying that you're going to do whatever. I fell a victim to that in my career. Uh, one, in one year, I went from 175 to 160 to cruiserweight, all in I world title it. fights. You understand what I'm saying? That's not very yeah. smart because – I'm thinking that, hey, I'm going to be the same Otis Griffin that I was at light heavyweight at all these other weight classes, and, 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 and that's against the laws of physics. So Tank, I believe, is going to stay right where he is because he has good advisory, you know, uh, with, with, with his trainer and, uh, and also uh, 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 everyone else that's around him. So do you think Shakur waits to move up to the 140-pound division? Or does he stay at 135 to get that super fight, to get the 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 odds of thinking, to get the professionals thinking, to get everybody dreaming of a super fight at 135 pounds? Is he ready to take on Tank Davis's next fight, or does he need another outing? 
Shakur is, is ready to take on uh, anybody, I, I believe. But he would he would probably uh, right now he's going to force the uh, 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 the issue with 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 Haney. Haney's going to and everybody's going to be talking about. It. They're going to say, "Oh, Haney's running from Shakur and everything." So Haney will he he will go up to one forty because he's just you know he can't hold that that weight too much longer. And it wouldn't be wise for him to fight Shakur Stevenson because Haney's still a little bit green. When it comes to someone that's as a cerebral fighter as Shakur, um, so with that being said, I think Shakur will have uh, about one or two blockbuster fights at uh, at 135 because he hasn't been there that long either. And then he's gonna he's gonna chase Haney down. He sees when I look at when if you look back at that fight and you see him get in the ring, that's the same look. And I know this is not real life or whatever, but that's the same look. That um, that I'll give you two examples. The same look that Clever Lane gave Rocky, <laughs> yeah, in Rocky Three, right? And yeah, the so same look. Well, actually, Clever Lane actually and even gave that look to Apollo Creed in there, kind of that side bust. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. That's a good point. But then in real life, and this is back when I didn't even know who this guy was. Shame on me, but you know, this is I'm a, a little kid. I remember Vander Holyfield jumping in the ring back when Mike Tyson was on top. And 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 uh and Don King was like, hey, get out of here! Like nobody wants to hear. And he was like, hey, when you gonna give me a shot? When you gonna give me give me? And I'm like, man, as a kid, you know, you thought Tyson was Superman. So I'm like, I'm like, man, who is this dude, man? Tyson to kill yeah. him, man. They're like, oh, that's he's a cruiserweight champion. He's moving up to heaven. I'm like, oh man, what? Like Tyson to kill that dude? Oh man, he 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 shouldn't even be in the ring or whatever. That's the same look that Shakur gave him and, and it's funny how history repeats itself he saw yeah. something that night when he was fighting llama that he is not gonna let go of he's gonna yeah. chase him to the ends of the earth no no i mean that's why sugar ray leonard came out of that uh, re uh retirement five-year retirement he saw something in um uh, uh when marvin Hagler fought uh the beast mugabe and mm. to his knowledge he got hit by too many right hands he saw something that made him come back and no tune-up, no nothing, and just put on a Picasso. I, I had it personally a draw, mm. uh, but, you know, hey, that's what I had it at. And let me ask you something, because because sure. uh, a lot of people, you know, I, I went back and, and, and watched that fight several times. Of course, you know, it was before my, my time. Um, with that being said, and I don't want to disrespect the great's name, R.I.P., a lot of people think that he threw the fight Hagler because he wasn't as aggressive. And then after that, he moves to Italy for 20 years. And, and turned down a rematch. Yeah. Like, so what is your thought process? When he had uh, Sugar Ray Leonard on, on the, and the first time anybody's ever asked me that, and first time I've ever said anything like that on the air, when he had Sugar Ray Leonard on the ropes, he was pity padding. Uh, that big left was telegraphed. I thought, I thought maybe that came with uh, just trying to maybe conserve energy, but I thought he could have done more damage when he had Ray Leonard up against the ropes, especially in that ninth round, uh, tenth round. Um, that, that's just my take on that. But I'll take it a step further. I think when uh, Kovalov fought uh, Canelo, I think Kovalov was holding back on that right hand because that right hand was there for the making, and he didn't release it. So that's my take on that. Hey, since we're on that. Listen to this, though. So me being at, at Golden Boy, I know that a lot of uh, the fighters, they are invested in Golden Boy, meaning that they are financially invested. They get percentages yeah. of, of, of the company and, and the growth and, and everything. Shane Mosley fights uh, Floyd Mayweather. Fourth round, I believe, maybe a little yeah. bit later. Hits him with an overhand right. Floyd is done. He actually holds Floyd up. And, and, and is in a clinch. Like, if he lets him go, he, he probably falls to a knee. You understand what I'm saying? What, and why and, and may not go? recover. Yeah. That was... Uh, yeah. So, and, and what I'm saying is, when you do the statistics, Shane made more money off of uh, 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 of Mayweather going on and fighting because Mayweather also, uh, uh, when when he got to fight with De La Hoya and everything, he, he also... Much like uh, the old school uh, uh, Joe Lewis and uh, Max Schmeling, he also gave a, a percentage of, of his uh, earnings per life to, to Golden Boy, uh, uh, to, to De La Hoya and Golden Boy, just for the opportunity. A lot of people don't know that either. Yeah. So with that being said, he made more money losing to Floyd than he would have winning to Floyd. 
So what did you think about about that fight? Since we're th- oh. talking about the the uh, the eerie mystique of you know fights. Well, I'll say this, and and, and I'll be brief on it. Um, when a two hundred and fifty pound running back ran Deion Sanders' way, he said, "That's for linebackers, Deion. Why didn't you hit him? Because that's a business decision." <laughs> He didn't want. He didn't want no broken collarbone. He didn't want no anything. But don't get me wrong. Every once in a while, Deion will go low on you. But you know when yeah. he just kind of uh, nonchalant would make the tackle. He said that's a business decision by not going heads up with that big running back. So again, boxing is a business. People is a business. Marriage is a yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. Divorce is a business. Um, and you know, hey, he's sitting pretty right now. Uh, only on the fighter's voice said you hear uh, untold stories and untold facts. And um, man, I'm I'm gonna get that part when we <laughs> when we release this, and I'm gonna tag these guys, and let's find out what's really going on. Maybe we'll get some <laughs> feedback on that. Yeah. Hey, well, listen, man, I can keep you here all day long, real fast. How can the fans, the followers, and supporters follow you? What's your Instagram? What What's your Twitter? How do we stay in contact with you? Uh, my my Twitter is uh, and Instagram is uh, next uh, underscore gr eight. So if you look at it, it looks like next great. Um, uh, and it's underneath, you'll see Otis Griffin. Uh, my Facebook is Otis Triple OG, Otis Griffin. I'm on there all the time with my, my family and friends and everything. And then, uh, of course, I'm at Midtown Boxing in Sacramento, uh, uh, doing my thing all the time. So, uh, if you are a fighter and you're, and you're looking for a good manager, uh, and, and company that is going to, uh, uh, really, uh, get you all the biggest fights because we're connected to, uh, all the major promoters from Golden Boy to, uh, match room to uh, uh, top rank and, and so on and so on all around the, the world. We have over 60 fighters and growing. Uh, you want to get with uh, MG Ring Productions. And that's also on Facebook as well as uh, our uh, our number is, is in the book always. Uh, we, we uh, as I said, endorse fighters, get them in movies. We, 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 we use fighting as the vehicle to life acts after fighting. So be wise. Get with us, and you're going to have a great career. Hey, you're from the man himself. The former world champion is now reinvented himself in the management, in the movies, in the marketing. I want to thank our guest, Otis OG with Triple OG Griffin. Hey, got to have you back on the show. For I'm sure. Rich Ortiz, you. your host of The Fighter's Voice. And remember, it's always a wrap. Thumbs up for Richie. Okay, fight fans, it's not goodbye, but until next week. Remember, remember, remember. It's always voiceography at its finest. So on behalf of Richard Ortiz, the special guests, and all the crew, saying hasta luego, babies. And always, thanks for listening.